What's the base, dude? What's the base? <laughs> oh, this is a this is a stingray. Oh, no. Nice. This is a this is a '79 stingray. Have you ever played a stingray with flats, dude? Do you know what? I've barely played hardly any stingrays. Weirdly, I mean, I remember. Yeah, I remember seeing the video of you doing like you did an interview. I feel like with the Ernie Ball guys. I did right? do that. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I watched that. What was that for? I totally watched that. I can't even remember what it was. What you had a stingray. Did you did you end up giving it away or giving some of them away? Oh, dude. I We've know, given right? away so many bases, it just turns into this massive, big kind of <laughs> soup. A big soup. I'm, like, I'm not sure, you know. And right. yeah. Oh, do you know what's really pissing me off at the minute? That Those guys on Facebook. Do you know the, the, the guys that have like, well, whatever they're doing, they're doing some sort of like scam and they're like going around, like messaging people. So if anybody's listening and if somebody messages you on Facebook and they're like, hey, we're Scott's Bass Lessons, we're giving away at Bass, you just give, need to give us your bank details first. I'm actually, this is no shit. They're doing shit like this. Yeah. And they're trying to scam people. And I think that, and you obviously um, had the same experience when you get ran a giveaway for. I who sure was did. It with? Who were you running it with? It was Spectre. Spectre. Yes, yeah. Spectre Bass. It was Spectre. You had, these guys running around, hey, I'm, I'm Ian Allison, give me your bank details. What the? <laughs> oh, man. Also, like, a, a great tell if you're if you're wondering of like, oh, is this legit? Is, how is the how is the sentence constructed? <laughs> also, yeah. how many emojis are used? I, I remember like <laughs> the all of the all of the stuff that came from the fictitious Spectre accounts when I ran a giveaway, like eight different Spectre accounts were created. And then people would get these, you know, DMs like Hello, congratulations, you have won the prize. And then there would be, you know, flower emojis and happy face emojis. <laughs> and people are like, is this legit? I'm like, are you kidding me? The scammers I mean, of course, emojis. like, yeah, yes, yes. So, um, yeah, it, unless, uh, yeah, just check in and see. And no one, Scott or I or anyone from SBL will never ask for your bank details, <laughs> yeah. ever. <laughs> it's a bad day when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Is that still is that still not resolved? No, no, it's still. Well, oh, it might brutal. it might be by the time that we've done this. So if anybody is listening so. and you don't know, like, like we've we've done a couple of announcements on Instagram. We've probably done the same thing over on Facebook as well. Um, what we what you have to do when these people crop up and start pretending to be you and then reaching out and contacting people and saying, hey. I'm from SBL, give me your bank details, all of that crap, right? You've won a base. Yeah. All I need is your bank details to give you the base, all of this stuff. Simple. You actually report them to Facebook, but nothing happens. They just don't yeah. do anything. Like nothing, they literally don't give two monkeys about it. They're just like, yeah, whatever, you know. So it's, it's we have, and we've had, we've reported them multiple times. We've had like, you know, tons and tons of community members have reported them multiple times. Page is still up. So now yeah. I think that we're trying to get the page taken down on some kind of sort of like trademark infringement or something because they're using the logo. We can try and get it taken down that way because obviously the SPL oh. logo is a trademark. It's just bonkers, though. It's just it's so insane. Facebook, I'm so sorry. Get your <laughs> shit together. Like, seriously. Oh, I know. Yeah. Oh. I'm going to just call it another name and hopefully people will forget about how crap we did. I mean, come on. Oh, I know. I know. Oh. Come on. Yeah. Meta oh. Meta is all fine and good, but let's let's deal with uh let's deal with some of the real problems. I mean, yeah, that that last giveaway that I did, I mean, you know, and my Instagram channel is a relatively small channel. Um and the Spectre one isn't huge either, and there were I think I think we counted there were eight fictitious Spectre accounts that were made wow. um, to scam that giveaway. And then once the giveaway was over, they all disappeared. And um, you know what? It was a bummer because it made me not want to do one again. Because <laughs> yeah. it was such a huge pain in the ass. Were you were, um, were you reporting all of the pages? And my, my assumption is oh, because it's yeah. Facebook, they do squat about it. Do they just not do nothing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if they ended up doing something about it or if, you know, I mean... You know what if you were a scammer you would just move on to the next opportunity you know so yeah. i don't know if you, maybe they just deleted their own pages i'm not sure but the pages are now gone um but yeah it made me really uh wary they'll definitely delete their of own giveaway pages. thing yeah they'll definitely yeah, delete their sure. own yeah like 
because Facebook are just a big pile of steam and crap. <laughs> but sorry, Facebook. <laughs> sorry, Mark, if you're listening in. But seriously, I'm, yeah. I'm just had sorry, it with Zach. it. Honestly, yeah, sorry, right. Zach. I know it's not his <laughs> fault, you know, but I've just had it with it. I'm just so sick of it. Like, we're trying to do all of this awesome stuff, and then, you know, and, and look, and there's always going to be scammers out there. There's always going to be, and right. that's fine. You know, more power to the scammers. Go do your thing, right? <laughs> Like live that life, but like if they, if Facebook just can't put up some kind of mechanism or have some kind of support in place to help people that, oh I know, just it's it's just incredibly naive, I think, on their part, and I think that, uh, like, to go sort of like super nerdy, should I do this? Should I go nerdy? Do you know what NPS score? Yeah, please. NPS NPS score is like how happy are your users with your product and it's measured oh, by something sure. called nps score it's a really really popular um popular tool probably the most well used tool or well-known tool when it comes to taking the temperature of how popular your um business is and and ours by the way is something like i think it's like 85 or 90 percent which is just incredible which is amazing that sounds good yeah we did like an yeah. nps yeah. thing for sbl and it came out incredible anyway but while I was researching NPS scores, um, it, it, Facebook's NPS scores always been like just <laughs> the worst. It's right. just been the worst. But the actual this art, these articles that I, I was reading about it, it just showed how incredible the network effect of Facebook was when they launched and the size that they've grown to. Because even though their their net their NPS score has always been just atrociously bad. Still, they just completely dominated the heck out of everything. You know, they just yeah. crushed everything. So it's just, yeah, interesting. Anyway, oh, I'll stop bitching and moaning. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, l- let me let me read you something. Let me read you something. Check this out. Remember, okay, so episode um, episode one forty five, the ups and downs of family life as a musician with Scott. Oh yeah, they, people said some really nice stuff about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a lot of a lot of DMs, a lot of messages about that. And remember, in there, we were talking about how you and I both struggle with being present oh, uh, wow. because we love what we do so much. Sometimes the big struggle with family um, is just to be mentally present, not physically present, because hey, we're there. Yeah. Uh, but to be actually mentally present. And remember, and you said if there's anybody out there that has the answer to oh, this, did, please. Did, did somebody message in? <laughs> yeah, somebody oh, did. wow, what did they and, say? And, well, I'll, I'll read it to you. I mean, and, and here's the deal. There's no, you know, as I, I listened to that episode and I thought, you know, this is not something that we're going to just be able to cure, of course. Mm-hmm. This is just something that we have to live with and we have to manage. So, you know, I, Scott, I'm sorry, I don't have the cure in my hand here, <laughs> but I do have potentially... <laughs> A managing tool. So check this out. This is from Russell, who wrote in and said, um, listening to the most recent SBL podcast, I have a mental slash digital exercise that used to help me leave work at work back when I was a chef, if you're interested. And in all caps, I said, please. Yeah. (laughs) And he said, okay. So we use this method in my new corporate gig too. It's kind of like uh, an idea parking lot. What I do when I either left work or got home is I'd start a list of all the shit that was currently on my mind. Usually I'd open a notes on my phone and date it right when I pulled into the garage. Then literally mind dump into that note. And then here's the hard part, let it all go. I found my biggest fear was forgetting something good. So I'd find myself fixated on those ideas when I was supposed to chill with the family. That's the downside. LOL. The other key thing that if I found myself distracted by thinking of something on that list, I'd pop open my phone, highlight, or star it. Mm. And and I wonder if that's something, it, it's such a simple thing, right? And I have never done that. But my wife has talked about similar things. Like she uses Trello and gets these Trello boards all set up for all the things that she has to do so that she's not carrying it here. Yeah. And I don't know, have you ever tried anything like that? And has it worked for you? I'm a big fan of Trello, but I've never used it for that. But yeah, just shout out to Trello. You're awesome. Yeah. Um, it's like a, it's not a note taking app. It's kind of sort of like a project management tool, but it's great. Um, I haven't, but I haven't, but I don't, but I totally, I totally in terms of, and I, and as you were reading through that and you said, 
just brain dumping to get it out somewhere because, and it was what he went into saying, I'd, I'd get fixated on what I thought were good ideas. And I was yeah. afraid that I was going to, you know, and that's what I get fixated on. It's that yeah. stuff. It's either fixated on, on good ideas or stuff that I believe might be a good idea. Two right. different things sometimes. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. fixating on what I think is a good idea and obsessing about it or obsessing about something that I think it should have happened or I want to happen and hasn't happened or I don't think will happen. So like all of, you know, so it's definitely... So, yeah, I guess the, the point is, are we fixated on some of this stuff just because we feel like we need to hold on to it? And if we put it in or on or, yeah, into something like a note-taking app and just dump it in there, then we can revisit it and we don't have to sort of like necessarily cling on to it. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love the idea. Have you tried it? No, because <clears throat> I just got that. I mean, that, you know, um, right now, as we're recording this episode, that episode just came out this past Friday. So only a couple days ago. So it's very fresh. I think um, Russell sent that DM maybe yesterday or the day before, but it's really given me, it's given me pause. And I wonder if that would be helpful. I think for me, it's just, it's so much. It's the culture. I want to be with the instrument. I want to, you know, there's so many things. It's not just ideas that I have. It's, you know, the, uh, the amount of time that I want to spend, you know, with the instrument. But I do think though, that especially thinking about like content ideas, I'm always running, you know, video stuff, thinking about uh, the next video to make or like playing on something and like sounds and pedals and pedal board builds and all that. I think if I could mm -hmm. maybe dump that into a note, it might help um, leave it, leave it, you know, for another time. And he said, the hardest part is that you have to then let it go. After you do the dump, you have to then for that next, you know, 12 hours or whatever it is until you revisit it, you have to let it go and that that's the hard part. But I'm going to give it a try. Yeah. I do like it, yeah. I think that I think it's a great idea. I was thinking about something else I, I really suffer with as well, which doesn't help. I, like I feel real ADD sometimes. I feel mm. like I just I'm sort of like biting around a million ideas and, and my yes. attention is just going like back and forth, back and forth. It's actually a little crazy sometimes. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> like, I even piss myself off. I'm just like, really? Can you not just focus on one thing? Right. Does it have to be five things all at once? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah. I'm definitely going to give it a go, actually. Um, was the guy's name Russell? Russell. Yeah. Russell. Cheers, Russell. If you're listening, Russell, thanks so much. I actually, Russell has given me an idea. How about we do a daily podcast, Ian, called um, Ask Scott and Ian? Oh, right. I Check love it, it out. And we, there's something called SpeakPipe. I don't even know if this thing exists anymore, but it, you put it on the website and then people can go to the website and they can record a question. And then once a week, we could just get together. We could answer seven questions that people, and we'll play there. We'll actually play the clip of them asking that question in the podcast. It. They'll ask, they'll ask the question. We can batch it because obviously I like batching the content. We'll batch yes. it. And then we could have a daily podcast. Let's go. <laughs> I think that that's sounds really amazing. good. Yeah. I, yeah. I've been thinking about doing sort of like content recently. Not, not, not well, yeah, it, di differently and more of it. I was watching a YouTube video of this guy I really, um, I really admire. From uh, like he's a business guy, and he just, and he's, it, and sometimes I get lost in the complexity of business and decisions, right? You, you know, all of this. Sure. Listen to this guy. He just tells it. Just he just he just cuts through the shit and just tells it straight. He's like, you know, if you are if you are into creating content as a business, if that is really. Um, you know, it, it's really a, a really important part of your strategy as a business is like creating content. He says, just do 10 times as much. And then it just paused. He just, and, and then he said, no. He said, before you come up with any excuses of why or if you should, just do 10 times as much. He said, that's the answer. I was like, wow. Oh, maybe that is the answer. Maybe that is the answer. Well, so anyway, we we're about to find podcast. out. We should do a daily podcast. Let's go. I actually, know, I actually there's, there's a great podcaster called Pat Flynn who runs a podcast called Smart Passive Income. And he has a weekly podcast, but he also does a daily podcast as hmm. well. 
yeah. based on that concept of he's got speech pipe. I think it's called speech pipe. It might be called something else. Speech pipe. People leave him questions and stuff. We should do it, man. We should oh, do it. Oh, let's go. I, I mean, I'd, I'd be so in. Yeah, of course. Let's do it. Yes. Let's give it a go. Let's give it a go. Sorry, everybody's like... Ian, Scott, like, what are you even talking like? I'm just having a random conversation. <laughs> no, it's a- You're probably used to it by now anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is how this podcast opens. <laughs> every episode. Yeah, every single time. Yeah. You know every we're going to get there. We, yeah. You guys, you know we're going to get, we, you know we're going to get to the meat and potatoes, but there's a bit of a waffle at the beginning, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, today we are going to be talking about, like, last, last, in the last episode, we co- talked about the Ten Commandments to get in the gig. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about the Ten Commandments to keep in the gig. Mm. But before we even go there, tell me about the Wilcock bass. Oh, oh Wilcock bass? Yes. Yeah, and get you know it what? out. I have it here, too. Um, I just did a big unboxing video, but if, uh, if anybody's watching the video content, I, I pulled this out. It's so beautiful. It's black. It, you know, as you can see, it's jet black, um, high gloss. And then the back of the neck is just insane. It's, um, roasted maple, um, flamed maple, roasted maple. Yeah. yeah. And the body is roasted too. Viv Wilcock was telling me that, um, it's alder, it's roasted alder. And roasted maple, and then the fingerboard is this stuff called rock light, which is like a oh, like right, a yeah. yeah like a, a wood composite product. So the whole base is just like completely moisture free. And the idea with um, drying out or roasting wood is that then it's it sort of caramelizes, it kind of gets stiffer, and it becomes way more impervious to weather change climate stuff the idea is you have to adjust it less and then the idea too is that it's more resonant it's maybe sustains a little bit longer um and you know whether or not all of that stuff is true i will say that this neck feels like a piece of graphite i mean you can't move it it's it's crazy yeah and and it's and it's beautiful too, um, but yet it still is wood. It isn't graphite, right? So, and what kind um, of vibe is the? What kind of vibe is yeah. the? Bass? Like when you play it, is it? Is it yeah, like? Do you feel like it's a P bass thing, or yeah, is it a let's jazz it. thing, or is it just? Or is it its own thing? So I have it plugged it's got in that now. Got thing going on. Yeah. yeah. So this is the neck pickup, and the idea. Yeah, it almost has kind of like a hollow body thing in that neck pickup. And um, Robin Malarkey, or Rob Malarkey, who plays with Jacob Collier, I guess apparently played like a, a mid-70s Telecaster bass, which is one of those ones that has the neck pickup like smashed close up to the edge of the fingerboard and yeah. loved the kind of like woody, almost hollow body vibe of that. But then too, there's a sweet spot pickup that isn't really like a bridge pickup. It's more kind of like in the spot where a P is. And then it leans a little bit more throaty. P bass vibe. Sounds beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it's cool, right? And then in the middle, it's kind of scooped out. Yeah. Kind of like the jazz bass thing. But I really love that neck pickup. I think it sounds so cool. Have and you warm. tried it on a gig yet? Yes. I played it with uh, this artist named Jeremy Messersmith that I play with. And I, it was like a little theater gig. And I usually play my Starfire. I have a 60 Starfire that I play on that. And I played this, and it was really cool. Um, the Starfire is very short sustaining, but this thing has all of this, like, these notes just hang. Yeah. It's really pretty. Oh, it's um, lovely, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It's kind of glassy. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm I'm really enjoying Whoa. it, and there'll be a big uh, a big unboxing and kind of playthrough where I play play along to some grooves on the Groove Trainer and stuff. That'll be coming out on SBL, I think. You know, relatively soon. Oh, amazing! And that is that model called the Malarkey. Yes, this is the Malarkey, named after Rob Malarkey. And there's a great uh, Viv told me that he wanted it to be named the malarkey and signed off on that um as a as a bit of a as a bit of a nudge to his wife who didn't take his last name he said well something's gonna have my last name (laughs) 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 and it may as well be this bass dude amazing amazing yeah yeah. and if anybody wants to check out rob malarkey you'll find him on youtube he's not super present but he's got some videos on there 
that are definitely worth checking out. And he is an obscene, obscenely good player. Like yes, he is. Next level. He is next level. He is just crazy, crazy good. He's um, Jacob Collier's bass player, but oh, God damn that guy. He is so good. He's a monster. He actually went to Leeds. He went to Leeds College of Music. So when I moved to Leeds, Rob just moved away. So it was really interesting. So, yeah, because I moved to Leeds in my early 20s. I'd have been like 22, 21, 22. I'd just, I'd been working on a cruise ship for like six or seven months, done that whole thing. And and before that, so I spent a a year working in a theatre, you know, in the pit, doing that thing. Then I went on to the cruise ships and did a seven-month stint on a cruise ship, then moved to Leeds and so I like moved to Leeds. I was like, yeah, I'm going to get involved in the scene and stuff like that. And, and Rob was like a legend. When, when I moved to Leeds, everybody was like, oh, oh Rob yeah. Was like a legend. Right. You know, he was he's like the guy. The, the guy. Yeah. He's the guy. Not, not only just the bass guy, he's the guy of yeah. the scene. Just right. like full stop. He just, yeah, he was just. And I think that he's a great, he's actually, I think that he's, his first instrument might be keys. I, there was, you know, these things. Yeah, because he's like a multi instrumentalist, right? Yeah. He is, yeah, he's a good guitar player. I think he's a great keys player as well. And he's just got bonkers. Ah, so good. Yeah. So good. <gasps> but check him out. Yeah. Check him out. I'm trying to think of a great clip. There's a trio clip of him playing. I think it's um, Ellen Rigby. Oh, cool. With Jacob Collier live on YouTube, which is great to check out. Ellen oh, yeah. and Rigby's such a great song. Oh, it's so it's good. so yeah. great, isn't it? It's so good. <laughs> yes. It's obscene. The Beatles were so obscene. That they were so have you obscene. Seen the, have you seen the the film called Yesterday? I think it's called Yesterday. Um, is that the one where the guy is, yes. he's, he's yeah. doing the Beatles stuff and it's as if the Beatles never existed? Is it that? Yeah. So the, yeah, have you seen it? No. No, I haven't. I've, I've wanted to, but I haven't seen it yet. No. Dude, you've got to see it. So okay. the, 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 yeah, the, the idea is that he is a failing singer songwriter and he's, you know, and he's really trying hard and he's and yeah. it's just, it, it's got a really great British vibe to the film. Actually, he's trying his best, you know, like he's, his manager who is sort of like, he's one of his best mates yeah, like yeah. goes to all of his gigs along with sort of like three dogs and a couple a couple of old dudes and <laughs> yeah, you know right. what I mean like the literally nobody right. bush, bush weeds at his gigs you know and um, and he's <laughs> and it's like a few, it's probably sort of like 20 minutes into the film and he's just hit rock bottom you know what I mean he's just done sort of like he does a party for like a bunch of six year olds and they start heckling him you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. he's yeah. like hit rock bottom and he falls off his bike and like knocks himself out and when he comes around as it's sort of like the story transpires that nobody like basically there's all of the stuff the Beatles never existed right so whatever happens this weird thing happens in time with him falling off the bike and the Beatles and all of their songs never existed but he knows that obviously he knows all the songs well he doesn't really know all the songs but he He's the only one. Yeah, yeah. So he's trying to remember the songs and he's like, <laughs> Eleanor Rigby. And he, and he, be, oh, and he basically so becomes a freaking, he, he becomes a superstar off the back of it. But there is a really great clip in the film where Ed Sheeran and uh, the main character, and they're both, Ed Sheeran's playing himself and the main character is, um, is obviously playing himself. And they're, they're backstage and Ed Sheeran challenges him to a songwriting contest kind of backstage <laughs> in front of all his, all of his friends. Oh. And, and Ed Sheeran's like, come on, we've got, you've got 20 minutes. He said, we're just going to go away, write your best song, and then we'll play it in front of everybody. So Ed wow. Sheeran goes away, write, writes his song. This dude goes away and obviously he's, he's just going to use a Beatles song. <laughs> so Ed <laughs> Sheeran right. comes... Ed Sheeran comes back and, and plays this great song. And I was like, listen, I thought, this is a great song. Obviously, it was, you know, written for the film and stuff like that. But plays this song. And then the, the, the main character plays, I, I think it's like, I think it might be Yesterday. or so. It's just this phenomenal song. I'm like, yeah. oh, this Beatles <laughs> song. And yeah. I was like, it's so well written. When you hear it against something that 
has like a modern day, everything's kind of diatonic, you know, that's very Ed Sheeran, right? Yes. But with the Beatles, it just wasn't like that. It was right. really, really, the harmony was just so interesting. And oh, he, the, that's where you go. He plays the long and winding road. And it oh, is cool. phenomenal. It's the long and winding road. <laughs> it's, and it's so, the harmony is so beautiful. Oh, you've got to watch it, dude. Oh, I will. You've I will. That, I will. That's been one on the list. And and uh, and speaking, speaking of films, tonight... I have booked myself a ticket is this to a it? place to, to go see <laughs> Dune. <laughs> go I'm going to go see Dune tonight by myself. <laughs> a late you're show. On your own, yeah. Yeah, on my own. It's just going to be me. I actually love seeing movies by myself. It's funny because my wife was like, are you, uh, you going to bring anybody? Or you? I'm like, nope, I'm just going to go. I'm like, the, the only person I'd bring to this is Scott. So, Scott, you're going to be there in spirit with me seeing this movie. Have you seen that yet? I'll be there, man. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't yeah. seen it. I'm absolutely bursting to see it. I, um, do you know when you were saying I love seeing movies on my own? I'm like, I do actually like watching movies on my own, but I love watching gigs on my own. Mm, In fact, yeah. to the point where I actually don't like going to gigs with people sometimes because they freaking talk. I'm yeah, like watching wanna... the band, man. Sure. <laughs> and you know who the worst is? My wife. Oh, God. Oh, there's so many times. We were in New York together. Oh, I know. I took her along to this gig. I yeah. can't remember who was playing, but it was just sort of like, it was just, it might have been down like 55 bar or something like that. Actually, it, this, this has happened on multiple gigs. I've watched gigs with like, I went down to 55 bar many times, um, Smalls, which is another great club in New York, many times. And yeah. my wife's been to all of these places many times. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be there just sort of like watching whoever, right? And Lisa will be sort of like, hey, so <laughs> what do you think we should do tomorrow? I'm like, dude, <laughs> this is now a life changing moment. Yeah, now is not the time. Yeah. I could have been in 55 bar and I was like a massive fan of like Mike Stern and Richard Bonner and like all them guys, right? And she's just and, to uh, her, these, these are probably just sort of like, probably. you know, I don't know, just some other guys. There's just some guys playing the yeah. gig, man. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. She doesn't give yeah. two hoot. And, and she's really, <laughs> she'll just speak to anybody. So I had this really funny time. We were in 55 bar and and it was, and like Lincoln going, no, not Lincoln going. Lincoln Goins was playing another night. This night it was Richard Bonner and it was Mike Stern. And they were doing wow. this killer gig. And like every sort of like minute, Lisa would be like, oh, but, and I'd be like, dude, dude. <laughs> right, anyway, so in the break, I'm like, oh, I need to, I think I was smoking at the time. I was like, I'm going to go have a cigarette outside and then I'm going to come back. So Lisa's like, okay, it's two, it's in January. So she stays inside the 55 and I go outside for a cig, have this cigarette, come back in. She's like there, like in amongst Mike Stern and Richard Bonner, <laughs> like taking, <laughs> say, taking selfies and stuff. I'm like, what is Unbelievable. <laughs> Oh, you yeah. you need her. She's the icebreaker. She's the she's the oh, social she's icebreaker. Great, yeah. <laughs> she's, great, she's great. Anyway, enough of my uh, story. Yeah, that's great. Should we do it? The Ten yeah, Commandments. Sure. For keeping the gig. Let's let's keep that. So, gig. yeah, let's keep the gig. So, if you were listening last week, you'll have known that we did the Ten Commandments to get in the gig. If you didn't, I'm going to give you a quick run through, and this is in, in terms of getting the gig. So first off was well, number one, community is everything. Get involved in your area, jam nights, open mic nights, local gigs. Okay, anything you can build that community. Number two, don't be afraid of taking low paying gigs. Mm -hmm. And I went in on to talk about how it is a free trial. I actually was watching another YouTube video of a, somebody I follow online um, that's not in the music space, in the business space. And he, and it really made me think about this point actually, he, he was asked a question. The guy was like, what, what, what do you think, you know, up and comers should do? People that want to be entrepreneurs or get into business. Or da, 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 da. And he was like, just go find somebody and try and work for free. He yeah. was like, and do a better job of it. And I was like, wow, it kind of reminds me of, you know, what we were talking about last week. If for anybody's sure. freaking out and saying we're devaluing, you know, music, please go listen to um, the conversation last week, we are definitely not devaluing anything, okay? Uh, number three is have a level of visibility online, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, that is your CV. Number four is create your own projects. Don't wait for the doorbell to ring. Number five was learn tunes and repertoire, whether it be in jazz, pop, rock, metal, or you know whatever, but it, it makes you more employable. Number six was learn to read and write charts. 
Notational is optional, but obviously it's a bonus if you can do. Number seven, invest in your sound. Because people love a great sounding bass. That means, you know, get a, a decent sounding bass, a great amp. Don't have your amp break down on stage like oh. my friend did and get sent off stage doing Same the walk here. of shame. Same here. Oh, number eight, <laughs> be a great communicator via email and text. Have fast and prompt re replies. Number nine, my favorite, get a bloody driving license. <laughs> Uh, number 10, be curious, ask questions, don't be that silent kid at the back of the class. And the bonus tip was practice your ass off whenever you can. Ultimately, your bass playing is where the book stops. So, the 10 commandments to keep ten, in the gig. 10 and a little extra. And I want to just mention, too, to anybody listening, if anybody listening thinking, oh, well, Scott and Ian here on their, you know, on the on the high podcast horse talking about this, I wonder if they managed to do all those things successfully throughout their lives. I'll just speak <laughs> for myself. No. I mean, there are things of that list that you say, Scott, that I'm like, Ugh! like I have specific stories that I go back to and I remember, I go, oh, and we talked about a little bit of that in the last episode, but I just want everyone to know that this isn't us saying, here's what we have learned and we execute flawlessly at every gig and we're, you know, we're able to get all of the gigs. And this is just almost, um, I feel like some of this stuff is talking to ourselves too, right? Reminding oh, yeah, us sure. of yeah. what the most important things to build a career to get the gig is. So if anybody's listening and thinks, oh, okay, yeah, whatever, you guys have it all together, I suppose we do not. Or I should just say, I do not. <laughs> oh, <laughs> These I are do. still things I that I'm not. thinking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely, man, absolutely. Okay, so... The Ten Commandments to Keeping the Gig. Yeah, number keep. one. Um, number one is prepare your, and it depends on where you, you know, where you're from. But prepare your ass off when possible, or prepare your ass off when possible if you're from the UK. And <laughs> uh, you talked about the importance of this, Ian. You know, in terms of it doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's a low-paying gig or a high-paying gig, but just do the homework when you can. Do you want to speak to that? Oh, I mean, that is, it's huge. It's huge. And of course, I have had times when I've done it and have have really, really enjoyed. Uh, first of all, if you do the prep, you're going to enjoy the gig. And I feel like there is nothing worse than have having not done the prep, being on the gig and being really tied to charts or really just being in your own head of thinking like, oh no, what, what's going to come next in the bridge? That alone is just a bad experience. And here we are practicing, you know, it, to, to be on stage for 45 minutes or whatever. So why not? That's the time that we're all working toward, right? So why not make yeah. that time wonderful? Another thing, a side benefit that is actually a bigger, more blue looming career benefit in the end that you can't see at the moment is when you've done that prep, there will be people that will notice the band leader, the drummer, the keyboard player, and then that will upload you into things that you cannot see at the moment. Case in point, I maybe I've told this story, but briefly, I did a gig with a drummer named Michael Bland, who's a Minneapolis institution, was in Prince's band for a long time in the new power generation. It was a $50 gig. It was a ton of work. But because it was Michael and because I just, I needed to do it, I said, yes, I'm prepping, I'm playing hours and hours, getting my sounds together, the parts together, who is in that band, but my dear friend now, Elliot Bloffus, who happened to be Eric Hutchinson's MD, and I got as a result, the Eric Hutchinson gig, which I've been in for, geez, almost the last seven years now. Best gig that I've ever had in terms of a touring thing. And it was because I put the prep in for the $50 gig, right? For the gig that I thought, oh, I wonder if this is gonna go anywhere. But I knew that if I said yes, you gotta, met, you gotta have your yes be yes. And I knew that I had to do great at it. And then someone noticed. And so it's yeah. huge. It has legs. So prep for everything. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've had yeah. that experience too. Absolutely. And I think that to your point, I think that there's a secondary, the secondary element is, well, first, like primary is like, obviously prepare your tail off whenever possible. And the secondary part of that is, and that is, and when it comes to how much you're getting paid, that does not dictate how much effort you put into it. You know, you can't, you know, you, you can't have a rate, your effort can't be tied to the, the reward financially from the gig. So if you're getting paid $50, you still have to put in the same amount of effort as if it was a $1,000 gig. Yes. You just have to, because the reality is that on that $50 gig, 
you're going to be playing with probably somebody that you're going to work with in the future who or will not. be the gateway right. into or not <laughs> yeah, right. yeah who will be yeah who will be the gateway into you know better paying gigs you know, more, whatever. I mean, sort of like you will feel a progression, but the most important thing is that you don't, you don't ratchet back your, the effort that you put in if it's just a lower pay gig, because it's a, it's a really, really big mistake to do. 100%. And, and can we speak to this? I mean, that the prep thing, we both just spoke about it as kind of, or I was thinking about it more in terms of getting the gig, but do you have any thoughts of, around this prep thing in terms of, say, say you've been on a gig, whatever it is, is it church? Is it a cruise ship? Is it a wedding band? Is it, is it a high level artist? Say you've been on that gig for a year. What does preparation have to do with keeping the gig? I think it's just, it's because of the, what's the word? When you get on that gig and you've just, and you turn up and everybody can see that you've just killed it and you yeah. put in all of the homework, they will be like, this is the guy or this is the girl. It, this is, you know, to, to, like, to move forward it, into the sunset. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. You, you just gain so much confidence of other players when you do that that it will really relieve anxiety on their side and, and make them feel really comfortable in in terms of working with, with you on an ongoing basis. Yeah, and and check this out too. Here's, here's just another tip. I remember, so after I was with um, Eric for a couple of years, you know, here's the thing, you've done all the prep and then you, then you sort of coast. So there's this big uphill thing. And then when you've been in the gig, now you're coasting. Everyone knows the set, everyone, everyone, you know, you know it. And then, then it's up to you to find out how your band leader or artist likes things to move. Is it just, is it going to maintain this level? Or like with Eric, he would sometimes say, after we'd been doing a tour for a couple of weeks, he would say, hey, tonight... Everyone try something new. Just one thing, try something new. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Not every band leader has that priority. Not every band leader wants you to try something new. But I thought, yeah. oh, that's... So what it made me do is start to think about the tunes and really go in and say, like, how could I make the pre-chorus... Like, I haven't thought about the pre-chorus of this tune. How could I make that pre-chorus pop a little more? Or how... Or what's some space that I could leave that really highlights the keyboard, right? So for me, it's it's been about um, preparation, even into the gig, has been about revisiting that material and wondering, are you doing your best? There's probably room for growth at every stage, even though, even if you think the show is killing, right? And if you then talk to your band leader and say, oh, hey, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try this new thing and they respect that. Oh boy. Then that just shows them that you're in it, that you're still thinking about it, that you're not just thinking about whatever you're going to do after this tour, right? That's, yeah. that's a big thing to pay attention to. Yeah. Huge, huge on all fronts. Yeah. I, like I think it's, it's it's it. You have to. Well, it kind of sort of like feeds into something else actually that's going to come up. <laughs> so I'm not, I won't oh, talk yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. I was about Great. to sort of like get into it. But yeah, but absolutely. And also, when you're on those gigs, you are going to be given um, material to work on, and you know, like new material. Yeah. And just you know, again, it's like prepare your ass off when it comes to that. You you want to be turning up, and and you want to relieve anxiety. A lot of it. Do you know when it comes to keeping the gig it's like relieving anxiety on whoever's running that gig it's like relieving anxiety for them and if you prepare whether it's a new gig or you, you've had that gig for a while and you've learned some new material when you've prepared it just relieves anxiety for whoever's running the gig and it means it makes them feel like you give a shit and you're doing your best the best job you can um, and in number Great. two, actually, on, on this list, number two, and this is where I'm really crap, actually, but I, I do know um, a lot of people or a few musicians around here that are great with this. And people like my wife, for instance, who used to book a lot of musicians, and mm. this was really important to her. It was number two, be early to everything. Be oh, early. yeah. To be five minutes early, don't be the guy or the girl that's always late because yep. it freaking drives people around the bend. Yes. It really does, because it increases anxiety. Are you an early bird, Ian? Are you, you know, I'm always to the wire a little bit. 
crap with it, to be honest. I, I, I have tried to... I, I think it varies for me. Um, I have... <laughs> I did a, I did a story on Instagram, I don't know, probably about two years ago now that, that a lot of people were like, what are you talking about? I actually, so I've tried to be the early guy, but I turned up to a session once, you know, 20 minutes early, went in and that actually stressed out the engineer so much because he didn't have the stuff patch. He was like, oh, you're here. And... <laughs> <laughs> and it was at his house. <laughs> and, and so, you know, now I'm in his house and he's like, oh, uh, all right, hold yeah. on. And he wasn't ready for me. So I think, I think it's just contextual. I totally agree yeah. that if there's a call time, um, you know, you don't want to be the guy showing up last minute and plugging in a bunch of stuff. And when, you know, the band is like waiting around for you, I've had that experience at studios where the yeah. band is ready and I kind of show up maybe, you know, 10 minutes before, but everybody got there 30 minutes before. And I kind of feel like, Oh, they're kind of waiting on me a little bit, but I think it's just, I think it's contextual. Um, you know, the best thing to do is just like, yeah, air on the side of early. It's certainly better than airing on the side of late. Yeah, that's for yeah, sure. Just, just don't be late. Just don't yeah. be late because it. Yeah, it sucks for everybody. Yeah, it, it does. sucks for everybody. Especially, I'm not sure. Have you ever worked with anybody that's always late? Of course. And to, and when you're traveling somewhere, it always sucks, doesn't it? When oh, because it just adds and everybody's there waiting to go. Yeah. And it, yeah, and you're like, oh. yeah, this. Yeah, so maybe yeah. it should. Maybe that shouldn't be be early to everything. Maybe it should be like, don't be late to yeah. everything. Yeah. You know. I think that's right. I think it is contextual. Yeah. Number three, you'll know this one. Just don't be too loud. <laughs> oh man, that's that's really good. <laughs> don't be that's loud. really good. Oh, yeah. don't, don't be too loud. Um, I'll, I'll give this one. Um, I'll give this one some context. It's for bass players for whatever reason. It's actually quite easy to be to, to kind of swamp people with the low end and just yes. be too loud. And I know two really, really, really well-known bass players that everybody listening to this um, podcast will have heard of, both who have lost gigs, great gigs, with super famous artists because they were too loud on stage. I believe that. Like, the, str the struggle is real. And it is, <laughs> I like to be loud. Like, yeah. I like to be loud. And I yeah. think that, like, a few of my friends have actually... You know, they really lean into, like, having in-ears to help them with that, even if they're on a gig that doesn't necessarily need in-ears. Do you know what I mean? Like, they could just get by. You know, sure. It's not like a big gig or anything like that. But they'll use in-ears just to give them a little bit more um, so they can actually hear the bass just a little bit more. Right, you know? the clarity like, have you of the notes. Or... Like that? Yeah, exactly, oh. yeah. Because otherwise, you just kind of sort of... It sits underneath everything. Right. Everybody else can hear it as much as they want to, but as a bass player, you can't hear it as much as you want to. Sure, yeah. Hey, in the ass. This is, this is like such a, it's a tale as old as time, right? I mean, I think the volume thing, it's so interesting. Like, I've heard, you know, there's the, the 55 bar set that like talks about, oh, you know, setting up pedals like a DOD meat box or some kind of low end thing to step on at the right moment and yeah. blow up the PA. And, and there's a really interesting thing in that kind of like jazz world where it's these huge dynamic explosions. But m the world that I play in, like the more pop rock world is way more about like even levels. And I mean, I remember once I had, you know, a bunch of bass boost on a preamp and I had, you know, a big, big octave pedal sound. And I was working with a great front of house guy named Cody Anderson who did stuff for Prince. And I remember, you know, stepping yeah. on something to make this moment explode. And after the gig, he was like, what are you doing? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, dude, I mean, he's like, this is not some little bar, man. He's like, I've got subs on aux here so I can send tons of low end to the, to, like when you send me a 10 dB boost of low end, he's like, that's some Bush league stuff, dude. Don't do that. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> because I've been listening to these players that were playing in the, you know, these like famous jazz bass players who were like, oh yeah, you step on the DOD meat box and stuff explodes and that it, it's people again, cry. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, you know, maybe yeah. in a little, in a little PA in a little place that doesn't have big subwoofers, but it's more about like respect. It's contextual. Maybe that works in that small club. But for me, I was trying to do that in the wrong environment. Right. And so I've never had a big issue with being too loud on stage for people. If anything, I think I err on the side of being maybe a little too quiet and I get asked to turn up 
Um, and that's always better, I think, than being asked to turn down. But I really don't want to be the guy that's too loud. Um, but what I have struggled with is, you know, I play with all these effects and stuff. Over the years, I've struggled with levels. So sending front of house the right thing. So that they're not getting uh, exploded kind of, so with the levels big fuzz up, sound, like yeah. Down, yeah, yeah, right. So that you know you're you're sending consistency, no matter kind of what sound you're using. If it's a big aggressive fuzz sound or a or a big you know octave pedal thing, that still the levels are within like a three dB range, and that's something that you can do at home and just watch meters in a DAW or on a preamp and just kind of see when you're stepping on that stuff. What is it doing? Is it is it creating a huge boost at forty hertz that that you're not really hearing it? At home but you're it's going to explode in a giant pa system i don't know i think <laughs> yeah. that's you know that's worth considering too but yeah i think if you're the person I, i'm thinking right now about a context where there's a guitar player that i play with on a regular basis and he is perpetually too loud and it took a while for the band to like even even address it and in some bands it's probably like hey turn down but this band it's we're in the midwest everybody's sort of like polite and kind of walking on eggshells and and then it was this <laughs> huge issue and it just shouldn't be right like just err on the side of caution with your volume and and if you and if people need to hear more of you they'll ask you for that and that is so much better than being asked to turn down i think yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, do you, um, if you are a little quiet, do you ever, like, what have you done in the past where you've been struggling to hear yourself? Already? Yeah, right. Like, do you I just do... kind of struggle on and you're like, ah, if I turn up, I'm just going to be, you know, it's going to be too loud? Or, sure. Like, how do you combat that? Yeah. I, I always want to be at a level. I hate feeling like I'm so quiet that I'm hitting the bass too hard. I play with a pretty light touch. Right, and yeah. so I always want to have enough horsepower behind me so that I'm not overplaying and like clacking the bass. I want to kind of turn up so where I can kind of play comfortably. And even, and I don't know, that's, I don't actually feel uh, an issue with that too much. I've done a bunch of in-ear gigs um, in church and on pop tours and stuff. And that stuff's cool too. Although it, sometimes there you don't feel it as much, right? If you don't have an amp on stage, you know, just have ears, but I've gotten used to yeah, that yeah. too. Um, I don't know. I think uh, once I did a TV gig, it was in Canada where um, at the last minute, there was just no bass amp and there were no headphones and no way to monitor the bass at all. So I literally played without hearing a single thing. It was as if you have a bass on your lap that is plugged into nothing. And it was for TV. You couldn't hear yourself. Not at all. And so I just looked at my <laughs> hands and thought, God, I oh, hope this is so in G. <laughs> you know, like, I think it's in that's G. So you know, like, <laughs> but, but I will say this, the more that you have prepped, especially if it's a parts gig, I mean, if it's an improv gig and you really need to hear yourself because everything is new, it might be a different thing. But I will say if it's a parts gig where you're playing bass lines, um, I think that if you've done a lot of the work on the front end, you don't need to hear yourself actually as much or maybe as clearly as you think you do. In fact, sometimes it's kind of a fun exercise to even turn down to where you struggle a little bit and then see um, if you're playing and kind of keeping it light and keeping it together. And then you start to notice some of the other players around you maybe even a little bit more. Um, I don't know. I find that when my volume seems to be a mix instead of like it's just tons of me, I find that I actually am able to kind of get into the music a little more than if I just have me kind of cranked and I'm just hearing me and the drums. Um, that's satisfying in a way. But sometimes when I turn down, I find that I like... Oh my God, I've never listened to the backup singers in this moment. Or, you know, I've, I've yeah, never listened yeah, to yeah, the yeah, keys player yeah, play this yeah. thing. So I think, you know, as long as you're prepared, I think the volume thing, um, you're able to be more uh, judicious, you know, and, and, and a little bit more um, level headed about the volume thing. That said, I haven't played in tons of improv contexts where. I feel like my sound and my dynamic and my like immediacy of hearing my sound is really, really important. It's kind of like a lot of things where it's like well-worn lines that I really know. And then in that case, yeah, yeah. the volume isn't maybe as important to me, but I don't know, what about you? Got it, yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, like I've definitely struggled. I, I still struggle with that. I've, I haven't found out like a solution really. I have sort of like messed around with in stuff sometimes, which works well 
on on the gig, you know, sort of like if I can, like me personally, I love it when I've got in ears and a big old cab behind me. The best, you know, a big trouser flapper. You know, your (laughs) pants are just flapping away. (laughs) Your pants are just like flapping like a flag. You know, that's when, yeah, exactly (laughs) that. Like a good day for me is where I've got like my in ears and a turn up, and it's just like a fridge, like an Ampeg eight by ten. With like a big old valve, you know what I mean? Like an Ampeg head or an Aguilar, oh, you know, the old the Aguilars. Yeah, yes. yeah, like that. that's for me. Like versus on the flip side. <laughs> but like I'm sure you've done this before, man. You've turned up and you're not allowed an amp or whatever. So like, yeah. no amp. You have to plug into a DI. And then and then like you hear the monitor mix and you're just like, whoa. Oh. Is you're like, what's that weird? Set? What's that <sighs> weird instrument playing? You're like, oh, that's my bass, <laughs> and it sounds sort of like a detuned banjo. Yes, that <laughs> is mean, awful. Like, oh, and typically, like oh, monitor oh. engineers will will high pass those wedges so that they don't blow them up, right? So that everything yeah. under a hundred hertz is filtered out. <laughs> typically, that's what? the, you know, and then you're just yeah. like, well. You know, okay, this is going to be a terrible game. Yeah. No, that's a drag. To have a bad sound that you can hear really clearly is such so a bummer. Bad. I almost so would rather bad. than like turn the monitor off and just and just almost like feel it in the house rather than hear the like tinny, terrible like ten inch. Absolutely, <laughs> you absolutely. Know? Yeah. Oh, I had yeah. a real sort of like uh, uh, debate with the monitor engineer out in Montreal. I was doing the. Uh, doing something for the Grand Prix out there years ago and um, for Ferrari. And uh, we were doing some sort of like event for Ferrari and it was really cool. We were really looking forward to it, but the monitor engineer, oh, like everybody else was fine. It was just a bass thing. He was just sort of like, yeah, that's the sound. And I was like, dude, you've got to come and hear the sound. Like, I'm, I'm telling you it's bad, like, but you've got to come and hear it for yourself. So he came over to the monitor, played it, and he was like, Sounds good to me. I was like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, and, and that was the brutal. start of a long debate. It was brutal, man. It was awful. Anyway, yeah, don't be too loud on stage. Don't be too yeah. loud on stage. Number four is an interesting one. Don't practice on the gig. Oh. It's kind of sort of like this term that is thrown around a lot, isn't it? Don't practice on the gig. What does that mean for you? Wow, well... <sighs> I just thought, I immediately thought of something, and now I wonder if that's actually what you're saying. I immediately thought of in a session when people are just noodling in between takes. But maybe that's not what you mean. Oh, that as well. Well, that as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that as well. Yeah, Um, yeah, yeah. I remember doing that. Everyone does that in the beginning. You know, you're playing your licks or whatever, and you know, and everyone can hear you because you're on headphones or in-ears or something in a studio um, or, or in a practice space or too, too like at live in between tunes um, or especially at a rehearsal. Yeah. But I remember I really noticed this guy, Michael Bland, I've referenced him before, great Minneapolis drummer. He will sit, he will do a take. He'll, he'll, la- you know, he'll end the last take. Bow, crap, and then he will fold his arms and wait, and the sticks are kind of sticking up, you know, and he'll just fold his arms and he'll sit and he'll talk, but he will not hit a drum ever unless asked to like, hey, you know, check your snare, make sure and bang, 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 yeah, stops. Yeah. And how many drummers do you know? Or I mean, it's not just drummers, but are going and playing like playing some style oh, yeah. or like crazy busy that they're not, you know, and then the tune starts and they're going, yeah, yeah. Patch, boom, patch. They're practicing some chops. They're just practicing <laughs> yes, some chops or whatever in between, yeah. Uh, like, it is a mean, real thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And it really, I mean, I struggle with that, but I try in between stuff to turn my volume off. And then if I'm, I'm trying to work something out, maybe just work it out without the volume on, um, but really not try to play something that takes everyone out of the vibe of the thing that we're doing. I think that's yeah. really important. But But do you maybe mean practicing all the sick modal licks that you've been working on I, when well, you're playing both, don't man. stop believing <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah absolutely exactly yeah. but it's both yeah it's both i think that and, and i've definitely been guilty of both sure. like sure. def for me it's more the first one actually okay, what, okay. You, what you what you were talking about of in between so like you're on the session and and just for context just to give people kind of like so you can um just imagine this if everybody did this, it would be a complete like just noisy din between the <laughs> yeah, tapes, yes. right? If so, so it puts everybody. It kind of just 
It's like this unwritten thing where it kind of pisses everybody off, especially if they're experienced because they're just, yep. because it feels like you're disrespecting other people. It's almost like you're going to talk really loud ah, you know, and nobody can talk because everybody's got to sit. Nobody else can sort of like start doing what you're doing because then it's going to sound crazy. So everybody has to kind of sit there weirdly while you noodle about. Yes. An and it's just... It's like this unwritten rule that I wish somebody had told me about when I was getting into this oh, game. Oh, me too. You know, because it, and it outs it is you. Real. <laughs> it outs you as a noob <clears throat> oh, yeah. right away too, right? It, like everyone's like, oh, yeah. okay, yep. I, it, it puts you in a position <laughs> of like, click, you are like a, like a C-plus uh, experienced player, sort of like, you know what I mean? It's just like, the, we've got one of those guys. <laughs> yeah, we've got one of those exactly. guys. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So don't do it. But to, but to your other point, yeah, don't practice while you're playing the tune mm -hmm. either, especially when it's wildly out of context. And I think that you had your what was your example? You I mean, know, you know, you're burning modal your chops over over like a journey yeah. tune over "Don't Stop Believing." You know, like yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know. you're ripping out your sort of like your fallopian flat nine tune or whatever. <laughs> I mean, you like mode over sort of like "Don't Stop Believing." <laughs> I'm sure that this is going to fit in here somewhere, you know, you're like, because that has happened as well. Like I haven't done as much of that, but I've definitely been, you know, I've been, yeah, I've been there and watched people For sure. do that. And I've just yeah. thought, what are you yeah. doing? This is completely bonkers. You know, like, and sometimes it's like, it's kind of like an inside joke, right? I mean, especially in event bands or wedding bands where like, you've been playing, you know, brown eyed girl for a hundred years. And so then there's a moment where everyone is sort of like, you know, burn something and it's kind of like, ha ha ha. And I understand that. And I, I get that, but I never like to do something at the expense of the song. Even if it's a song that is really threadbare, um, I love, love playing with people that actually care about the song. Like the song is the thing that we're doing and we're, you know, we're at somebody's event, respect that. I, I get it when people do it, but I don't like it. And I never, I mean, like I never try to do that to elicit like a funny response from somebody. <laughs> it just, I really don't <laughs> love doing that, but uh, I get it. I mean, I also understand um, it can be kind of like a wink in the band for something, you know, that everybody hates doing. But then like, man, yeah. at that point, get a different gig. <laughs> You yeah, because it is contextual, isn't it? I, I think that on some gigs you can definitely experiment, you know, especially right. if it was like an improv gig or something of like course. that. Of course, yes, yes. More, yes, yes. more room for, for experimentation, but definitely if it's like a top 40 thing or like a events thing, you've just got to nail it down. And, it, and, and it, again, it, it depends on the context. Even, even like something's come into mind. I can't remember what the girl's name was. Girl, she wasn't a girl. She was a lady. She was—I think she was from Minneapolis. Actually, she was one of Prince's backing vocalists at one time. Oh, okay. Like back in the day, but she was over here doing a gig. I can't remember her name, and I can remember <laughs> she kicked my ass. Um, there was like a—it's it, yeah. I want to share this story because it's important because I think yeah. as bass players, we ha we have a, like a lot of power in terms of the cool things that we can do and sometimes it, it just doesn't work out this was right. one of those times so we're playing playing this tune and the chord sequence was doing its thing and i'm playing the roots and then i was like hmm i bet the bet the major third would sound great on the bottom of that chord there sure right so it, let's for let's for instance say it's gonna go it's going like c c c c f f g g now th those weren't the chords but it's, let's say for a hypo hypothetical right. um, moment it was right c c f f g g when it went back to the c i was like mm, i'm gonna play a low e in the bass it's gonna sound cool right <laughs> and you know what it did sound cool <laughs> did not think it sounded right, cool. right 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 <gasps> dude she told me a new one she was like old school she like told me a new one. <laughs> and i've i've had that like a few times actually mm. it's it's actually a personal um issue of mine is it i'm very i really like to reharmonize things on yeah. the fly it's sure. what i really like to do i really like to do it it's, it's kind of just of like i really dig harmony i really like reharmonizing and i really like to be experiment like experiment with bass notes under chords and i know enough about harmony to be able to do it well on the fly right but it really doesn't like 
bode well in certain circumstances. Yeah, I mean, you know... And I've there, definitely got myself into trouble like sure. that in the past. There are other crews, though, that if you did that, people would go like, whoa, people would give you big claps for it, right? It's it's yeah, totally yeah. contextual. Like, maybe in more yeah. of, like, a gospel R&B context. But in, like, a part-playing context, I can totally see. I mean, the gigs that I've done with Bland, too, like, he, he pays attention to the smallest things. I remember going from a G to a C through a B once. Boom, mm. boom, doo-doo. And he was like, and he has perfect pitch, and he stopped. And he said, that's not the part, man. And I'm like, what are you, what? And he was like, you're getting to that C from a B, man. I hear you play that. Boom, boom, ba, da, that three to four. It, it comes down from the D, man. It's the five. Boom, boom, B, da. That's what you got to play, go. man. And I was like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it really matters. Just it matters. Yes, yeah. that little yeah. stuff. It really matters. And what, what actually matters is figuring out it all comes back to this thing that this isn't really about music. It's about PR. It's about people mm. like you choosing to play the E over the C, the inversion is not that ne- not, isn't always, always a bad choice. It's just that in that context with that band leader, you stepped on a landmine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. She was like, like what it, are you doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, then, and then, and then, so you're smart and you're, and you're a good, you know, person who cares about this stuff. So then I, I bet you didn't like then just do it more to annoy her. Then you're like, oh, got it. You I file that away. <laughs> right. You file yeah. that away and say, aha, yeah, yeah. you have now just learned something about your band leader, right? In this context, that's yeah. not the right thing to do. But, you know, again, you play that on a more of like a gospel forward gig and people are freaking out. Like the more you can reharmonize, the better. And, you know, in some of those, yeah, I've had a yeah, few of yeah. those things and I don't know how to do that as well, or I'm not as comfortable in that zone. But I remember like thinking about, thinking about a third thing and, and people going, like whoa you know and, and loving it and yeah, yeah, yeah oh wow yeah yeah, 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 like, yeah amazing i need to learn how to do this better so it's just yeah it's it's people right it's learning your band leader yeah oh man yeah so don't practice on the gig don't throw any tritones <laughs> in when you when the note but that's another one of mine oh you know <laughs> tritone like, mm, subs yeah this d flat's gonna be great where that g7 is i've had that, oh man <laughs> <laughs> oh great yes yeah, so as as ian said right at the top you know we were talking about we were trying to keep it real and be like hey we're just we're sharing this stuff not because we we know all of it right probably because probably we, we've made all of these mistakes and <laughs> and continue and, to and do so <laughs> and, co- and continue know? to yeah. do so yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely yes. yeah yeah uh, the next was so number what we on one two three four five yeah, we're on number five right number five this is this is actually um one that I think is not not so obvious, but I think it's really interesting and definitely um, for a talking point. Number five, be consistent. Mm. Be consistent. And what I mean by that is uh, musicians that are really consistent, and, and I'm, assu- I'm assuming that, what's that guy you were just talking about? The guy, Bland. the MD who heard that, yeah. I bet his consistency <sighs> is absolutely on the money. And yes. any of those studio musicians, the really famous studio musicians, their consistency is just absolutely on the money. And it's something I've thought a lot about, I guess, in conversations with Sean, like I've met Sean Hurley a few times, and, and, when, and I've been there and watched him play, and he's just so consistent. It's his, just everything. Not only about, like, who he is, is consistent. I mean, his playing is mm. so consistent. It's it's almost like you could, it's just perfect all the time. He, it's, and, he, and he's consistently great at it. Like, and break that down. Are you talking specifically about his dynamic, about his articulation, about his like ostinato repetition? Like what is the consistency? Yeah. Just, just, just all of that, all, all of, of those things. And yeah. all of it, yeah. It's just sort of like, it's, it's just perfect all of the time. And he's, he's consistently great. He doesn't, he doesn't really have, like, I'm sure we all have bad gigs, right? But sure. his bad gig is going to be great because it's <laughs> yeah, because yes. he's consistent. You know what I mean? Like that, yes. His yes. bad gig is going to be great because he's so consistent. And right. he probably values, like, I've not really talked to Sean about, like, like if he values being consistent. But what he's, what he's talked to me on several occasions about is sort of like the cons- like consistency of notes, making sure that all of the notes have the, the same kind of dynamic and being yeah. very consistent within his dynamics and like it is important to him you know and i think to all of those studio musos it's definitely like this 
unsaid thing of consistency. So there's that side to it, but also consistency in terms of performance as well. Like, and a drummer comes to mind for me, a um, guy called Dave Keach, who I've not played with in, in, in many years, but I have played with him a lot in the past. And damn, that guy... Any gig that he just he did, he just he nailed it, and he just did it perfectly. Never overplayed. Never. I mean, he just and he was always super consistent. Oh, and what and a, what a gift he wasn't like, that is, right? Yeah. yeah, and he wasn't super chopsy. Wasn't flash. He was just insanely consistent. Mm -hmm. Just and his level was just great always. Yes, you know? and I think that it's again, it's sort of like. When you're getting into it, I didn't value that when I was... I just couldn't see it when I was getting into the into right. gigs and stuff as a pro musician. I just didn't see it. I didn't actually... Because because it's, it's almost invisible in a way. You can't see that, right? You're sort of like, you can see the chops. You yes. Know, you can hear the slap. You can do all... <laughs> or you can hear the... You know, all of that stuff. Right. But you, you're not really looking at somebody going like, man... They're so consistent. But at the end of the day, all of those guys, especially like that I know that are, that are really killing it in terms of gigs, keeping gigs. Yeah. Um, they're all, they're all incredibly consistent. In what they yeah. Do. It's tough. That's a long game thing, right? I mean, the short game, like you talk about, you're hearing the slap, you're, you know, the flashy stuff. That's the thing that maybe in the beginning, maybe impresses someone, right? Or like, oh, wow, a good mm -hmm. player. But really the keeping the gig thing. I mean, I think we're here, we're really talking about long game. I mean, we're talking about keeping a gig. Yeah. And boy, when you show up and you bring that consistency, I mean, and, and like you were saying, Scott, uh, it, it can be personally and it can be how you play, like show up with a great attitude, show up on time and be consistent in those areas as well. And then when you play, like I am always very wary of the musician that says, oh, I don't know, man, I never play the same thing twice. I'm like, eh. <laughs> that's like a super run red away, flag to run me. Away. Yeah, that's like a red flag. And again, I mean, just please, yeah. everybody, uh, take take me with a grain of salt. I am not in the jazz context that maybe Scott is. Um, you know, I'm in more of like a pop context. But when someone is like, "Oh man, yeah, whatever," I just love to play. Uh, you know, kind of whatever, and I never play the same thing twice. I'm like that is such a tell of an inexperienced musician or maybe a musician that's coming maybe from more of an improv world that is not respecting more of like a pop uh, uh, or or rock or indie world, right? They're thinking more in kind of maybe a blues context or something. But boy, that is, um, it's so fun when you show up to a gig and there are players on it and you've played the same songs for a few times and you know that they're gonna do it the same way that they did it on the last gig that yeah. felt so great. Like, you know, I play September, yeah. everybody plays September by Earth, Wind and Fire at, you know, yeah. at a gig, right? And, and the players that show up that I know that they're gonna, they're gonna do it like like the record, but maybe with a little extra flair yeah. in parts, and they always kind of do this thing, and it's so cool. Like I look forward to that. I actually yeah. look forward to consistency. And then when there's a little surprise here and there that pops out that feels like it's just adding to energy arc or adding to uh, the tune or responding to somebody, then that then that stuff is so welcome. But when it's kind of like always there's different things happening and we just don't have a place like a form or a arrangement of jumping off then that's when i start to feel like this isn't consistent and consistency is a great one that's that's a really good one it is also just to i just before we move on as well just just to point out as well that i've, I've played with people i guess consistency it's broad isn't it i think that that's what i'm getting to because there is like players that I've played with that are very inconsistent. Like, sure. There's two players jump into mind. Obviously, I'm not going <laughs> to name any names, um, but there's two players um, I'm thinking about in the past. One a, one a drummer and one a guitar player actually. And emotionally, when I did those gigs with those guys, um, I actually I can remember thinking, I hope I hope this I hope they do a good one. I hope they're good on this gig. Ah. So check it out. So so musically. They were great. So they had the talent, they had the chops and all of that, had the time, all of that. But they were actually really inconsistent. And where they were inconsistent was actually focus. Mm. So if they were like in it, sort of like engaged, they were great. 
But if they weren't and they were sort of like they turned up and they were thinking about sort of like what they were going to eat for breakfast tomorrow and that kind of shit, right? Yeah. That their consistency their consistency just went to toffee. It was just like it was awful. Mm -hmm. And they just played a really bad gig. Right. So I think that it's interesting for, you know, the listeners, you know, tuning in that you can be a great musician and have all of that stuff together. But if you are not like locked in and actually engaged, focused, your consistency can go to shit. It can totally really, like really harm you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And people pick up on it so quickly and then you yeah. lose the gig and you might wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> right you might yeah, lose that yeah, gig and you absolutely. go geez I, I thought i was oh, i don't know i'm a good player i'm a good you know but that's why you're listening to this podcast everybody to get the commandments <laughs> you're keeping the gig after this i mean geez man i i'm gonna go back and listen to this and i'm gonna take some notes for myself i'm like Ugh, this has been sliding for me lately <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta up my game man <laughs> i'm with you man i'm yeah. with you uh, number six actually is, um, this was in last week's as well. Number six is be a great communicator via email, via text, fast, prompt replies. Oh, yes. If you've got the gig, you don't want to be the dude or the dude out on the gig that is just a pain in the ass to get hold of. Yeah. Oh, look, Ian's dropping his well, head down. I just, I just there's, a little bit, there's, there's a little bit of shame in there, Ian. A little close to home <laughs> for a few things, I think. <laughs> Yeah, oh, no, it's I very know. true. Me too, me too. I've, I've been great with it in the past. I go, I fluctuate with this one. When, when it's really important to me, so when I, you know, when I was in a situation where I wanted to sort of like be very employable on the scene and stuff yeah. like that, I was so shit hot when it came to, um, to this. But yeah. now I'm just, I'm a little loose. <laughs> a little loose, man. A little loose, man. <laughs> Anyway, moving on. <laughs> moving on. Oh, just number like, seven. Let's, uh, let's move on. Okay. Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, number seven is be a great hang. Be cool. Be enthusiastic. And don't be overbearing. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. So important. So, so important. important. Yeah. In fact, I, I learned this through... Um, because we kind of sort of like... It's all around us when we're gigging, when we're touring, when we're doing that thing. It's all around us. But you know these kind of little moments in these inflection points in life where somebody says something and you're like, and it kind of like gives you a glimpse inside the matrix. Well, there was a guy here in Leeds had a, a bunch of bunch of great gigs, um, and his playing was eh, you know, eh, you know what I mean, like super average, super average. Sure. But great guy. So I'm talking, it's no Steve, right? So I'm, st I'm talking to Steve. I'm having a few beers after a show. I think we're on the same bill. And I can't remember what I asked him, but it was something along the lines of, dude, like, how come you, you get some great gigs, man? Like, I, 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 I am like, just, just for context, I'm like super unhustly. Like, I'm probably the least hustly person you, you've ever met. So it would, it would, I'm trying to think of what, how I would have phrased it. But it was, so, it was probably me saying, dude, man, you get some great gigs. I'm really pleased for you. Or whatever it is yeah. that you are, uh, yeah. you know, what a great spot you're in right now. Whatever it was. And he, his, he, he, he replied and he was like, do you know why I get all the gigs? And I was like, no, why do you get all the gigs? And he was like, man, I get all the gigs because I'm super easy to hang out with. And, I'm, and, I, and I make everybody feel great. <laughs> and I was like, huh? and it was, wow. and it's obvious, but yeah. it was just him saying it. And then he went on to say, he was like, look, I know I'm not the best bass player. He said, I know that. He said, you know, I'll never be that guy. He said, but if you're coming on tour with me, if he said, I'm really dialed in to making feel, people feel comfortable and yeah. people feel, feel like a family. And he was, he was like the guy that just pulled everybody together socially. He was I, it was it's hard really to describe but he just had some this warmth this energy he kind of sort of like when he's older you'd be like oh man i wish that guy was my dad he's that kind of guy yes right? he's always yes. been that guy and he was like that's why i get all the gigs yeah that's why i got all the gigs and just to add to that he was actually really consistent and his tone and sound was great as well so he might not be in a great the greatest player but he but he had his shit together right but he was just that's he was just saying, you know, that thing. And it was at that point that I thought, ooh, you know, it's really, and, and that kind of made me reflect on uh, what am I like, like socially? For sure. On a gig, like, 
because I'd never really reflected on it. And I think that I'm probably just, you know, putting my hand, I think I'm a little intense. In fact, I know I'm intense. Sure. Probably too intense. I'm not, you know, I'm not the, I'm not the sort of like the huggy, uh, well, I actually am super huggy, but, um, but maybe a little like in an intense way. Sure. <laughs> I'm sort of like, yeah. Come here. <laughs> no. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm super like that. I'm super like that. COVID was my worst enemy. Oh, like, cause I was the huggy too. guy. Me too, actually. I'm, oh, man, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huggy I'm, guy too. Yeah. I'm a big hugger, man. But yeah, but it made me think it well, it just it was the penny drop. I looked inside the matrix and I was like, ah, oh, you've gotta make people feel really comfortable. You can't be overbearing, you can't talk too much about yourself, you can't command the conversation, all of those things. It's just sort of like you've got to pay attention to them if you are maybe like me or like you, you like somebody else like sure, me for sure. or I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit intense but maybe if you're if i've like a dark like some people i know have got a bit, bit of a dark personality you know right. a little bit depressive and and that kind of thing you know that's not me but again you've just got to be aware of how you're making people feel in, in on the gig in the room you know with man your, absolutely with your, your co-musicians it, and yes and it's so easy to talk about and everybody talks about it but it's e it the hard thing is that it takes self-awareness and self-respect and self-esteem it takes mm. you being really comfortable in your own skin and so it's not really yeah. something that you can practice it's not really something that you can say like well if i leave the house 10 minutes earlier it's going to solve this problem of being late like there's a very simple way yeah. to solve that just logistically but being a good hang is more nebulous i think i, I will yeah. just say that what i have encountered in terms of a a tangible way to start to solve this problem is if you are super prepared for the gig and you're not nervous and you don't need to ask tons of questions about what happens on this bridge and Got that it. bridge. Yeah. yeah. I think the prep actually for me helps me then to just to be in, to be uh, talking about kids, talking about the movies, talking about, you know, just to like to be a hang when i feel like i'm nervous or i'm not gonna cut it i don't belong when i'm when it's the self-doubt or uh, imposter syndrome stuff that's creeping in that's i think what makes me feel a little too intense or a little like i'm going kind of over the top because maybe i don't feel like i deserve to be there or i haven't done the work to be there or something but when i feel the most like myself and the most comfortable in my skin is when the preparation for the job is long past and I can actually just like look someone in the eye and talk about music or movies or family or whatever, and just be in that space yeah. and kind of go with the flow. Um, that that for me is like a tangible way to increase my level of hang, you know? Yeah, like I definitely need to do work on this, man. I'm just, yeah, I'm a little intense. I'm, I'm definitely a little, I'm just intense. I'm intense and I... <laughs> Uh, what's it is it commanding the conversation I, i've got a really bad habit of dragging the conversation to somewhat to, to sort of like something that interests me i'm a bit sort of like i think with lisa i mean like lisa's like it's got what like what are you talking about she was like i just asked you about sort of like th this thing and you you said like three sentences and now you're talking about something completely different it's like this automatic thing i'm really good at it i'm sort of like <laughs> you ask something within sort of like 30 seconds i have kind of grabbed that thing that you wanted to talk about and sort of like yes, it's this yes. Thing. <gasps> you're like have, have you seen the new f base lisa <laughs> <laughs> exact oh yeah that's exactly one she yeah. just yeah she says i'm so bad at it oh says, i am I'm too so bad man. At it. Yeah. i am too i need to really yeah. watch that uh, just just a quick story i was on a tour um and there was a artist that was opening this big tour it was uh i was out with hutchinson supporting kelly clarkson there was an artist mm. that had paid a lot of money to open this tour and that happens where like someone wants a 20 minute opening slot and then they're nobody they want the exposure so you pay for that exposure and this artist she was great um but green and she had a father who was a, a wealthy wealthy oil guy in texas and at any moment if he was talking to you wore a cowboy hat and boots and and at any moment if he could turn the conversation to something of his interest he would i'll never forget eric has this little dog named elmer who's a chihuahua with big ears adorable dog and is holding the dog and i remember this guy came up and said hey man your dog kind of looked like a bat and Eric said, oh, okay. And he's like, you like bats? And we said, uh, and he's like, you like the Batmobile? And we said, 
yeah. And he's like, check this out. And he opened his phone and then he proceeded to show us his airplane hanger full of Batmobiles. Like he collected Batmobiles, <laughs> all the eras, wow. special builds. I, I and suddenly he, feel better about myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, yes, because I mean, dude, everybody does this, right? I mean, I do it too. I feel myself doing yeah, it, especially yeah, with my wife yeah. talking about opportunities or something cool or, you know, something cool I'm doing with SBL or on a gig or, you know, yeah, yeah, I do that yeah. too. But this guy was the ultimate. I'll never forget. He saw an opportunity. He thought the dog looked like a bat. He really Really wanted to show us his huge collection of Batmobiles, <laughs> and that was his in to put his big phone in front of us and show us all of his Batmobiles. So you're not so bad, Scott. It's all good. <laughs> he looks like a bat. You like bats? <laughs> <laughs> It makes it extra funny because he has a cowboy hat on. <laughs> <laughs> it really did, man. It really did. Yes. Um, <sighs> it was just, it was a, It was such a funny, he was such a character. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, man. Amazing. <laughs> okay. So no, that was number seven. Be a yep. great hang. Be cool. Be enthusiastic, but not overbearing. Yep. Number eight is go the extra mile. Now, what, what I mean by that is carry the gear. Pick somebody up. Oh, yeah. Write out some charts. That's cool. Put in more prep. Like, just go the extra mile when you can. There is a gazillion opportunities to go, like, in all, you know, all of these sort of, like, gigging scenarios or rehearsal scenarios or recording studio scenarios. There's always, a, a, like, a load of ways you can go the extra mile. Always take it. Always take it. Oh, that's so good. And you use the word opportunity, and that is exactly it. Instead of thinking, like, oh, this guy always, this guy never brings a nine volt battery and he always asks for one. Or oh, this person always needs to get picked up. Or oh, there's never, there's never food at the, solve it. What if you're the person that, yeah. you know, decides, hey, you know what, this gig, part of the gig is bringing the nine volt battery for the guitar player. <laughs> or like, like if you can, I mean, you don't want to be walked all over, but you also, instead of seeing those things as pains in your ass, seeing them as opportunities to keep the gig. Right, opportunities yeah. to be an invaluable part of something. Um, I just feel like you know, in a band, like if you're in a band and you're all traveling on the road together, like in a van, you probably don't necessarily want to feel like you're just the person that's going to solve everything, right? But if there is that opportunity, <laughs> man, like oh, you know, if there's a drummer that you work with, I think Hurley was talking about this. Like, make sure the drummer gets food. The drummer on a session, make sure the drummer is happy, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like hydrated and fed. And I've thought about that since, and I've been on some sessions where I'm like, hey, to the drummer, like, do you need to, do you need to eat? I, I, like, should we, should we get sustenance? Like, I, wouldn't that be, you know, <laughs> because a happy drummer, right? Is, like, that makes the, that makes the world go round. Nobody wants a grumpy drummer. No. Nobody wants No. Oh. Or a grumpy band leader or singer. I mean, oh, I, I subbed in a band yeah. too where I couldn't believe it. I would watch this singer and he was the band. He was the band. He was the draw. He would be yeah. schlepping all of the merch and he would be out on stage in his suit, checking his monitor before every gig. Here's, here's one thing everyone can do. If you're working with a singer songwriter, guess what they don't like to do? They don't like to walk out in their cool outfit and go check, 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 t -t one, two, check, <laughs> check in the microphone before the fricking show. So guess what you do? Yeah. Pay attention to how they like their monitor and offer to dial in their station for them. Tune their guitar, walk up, get their wedge set, and then they walk out, pick up the guitar and you start the show. Like that is something yes. that everyone can do. And it is a huge game changer. I started to do that for Eric Hutchinson. And he was like, hey, will you just kind of be my tech? I'm like, yes. So tune his guitars, yeah. get his monitor station set. I text him when, you know, everybody gets out on stage. We play, run some stuff. I text him when we're ready. Hey, boss, we're ready for you. He shows up, puts on his guitar, maybe needs to make one or two small changes, but 
it's dialed, it's ready to go. He doesn't want to be up there yeah, yeah, for yeah. that whole time. It's not Respect all on that. Him. Yeah. 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 Right. Respect yeah. that great, position. Man. And you can do that at a local level. Anybody listening to this is thinking like, oh yeah, my singer does kind of, you know, and resist that thing of thinking like, oh, the singer's the prima donna and they should work really hard for, no, like what if you decide to respect that position and try to make that position even uh, more easy to be a part of, you will keep yeah, that yeah. gig. Yeah. You'll keep that gig. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a great one, man. I really love that. Um, number nine, two more to go. Oh, here number we nine, go. Actually, this was, this was number 10 for the last one, actually, for the 10 commandments of getting the gig. Number nine is be curious, ask questions. Don't be the silent kid at the back of the class. Yeah. Again, you know, just be open to, just finding out all of the stuff that you need to know. And if you're unsure of anything, just put your hand up and ask because people really respect that. And then it means that, like for me, I, I was in a situation where I kept on, it was like I was doing this jazz band thing. I was like in my early 20s, I wasn't really that experienced. And, and the endings, the endings of the tune in um, when you're playing a standard in a, in a jazz scenario, Man, like a bunch of different things can happen, and they're not written down. Right. And I just didn't know them. So yes. I can remember doing this gig and thinking, I just keep messing up these, these, these endings. And I'd done like two gigs with this band, and, and I just thought, well, I could carry on doing it. Yeah. And everybody's obviously a little annoyed with me. Yes. Like, they're not saying anything, but they're a little annoyed. So I yes. one of two choices. I could just keep pissing people off. Right. And ultimately, they would have just grown tired of me and possibly let me go. Or yep. I would have just ruined every tune at the end of it. And they just thought, who is this kid? <laughs> right. So I went right. to the MD and I said, I'm really struggling with these endings. I'm really struggling with these endings. What can I do to, 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 to basic, to, to sort of like make sure that I'm nailing these endings with you? And he was like, Oh, it's easy. So, and then he just sat down. He was like, well, you know, there's a bunch of different ways of ending these tunes, but in general, there's like three or four. And he said, yes. and then he just showed me them. And he was like, I'll give you a shout, you know, to let you know what's going on. And then, you know, in, in the next time we're playing the tunes and, and, and we'll take it from there. You know, two weeks went by and then I had all of the, the end yes. nailed. Everything was great. And it was huge. And I just, and I was really pleased in the moment that the, of the choice that I made, I was like, fuck, that was the right choice. Yes. Because I'd never really been in a, in a situation like that before. I, I, I just kind of sort of like, well, I probably had, but I'd probably just not said anything. Right. And maybe it just sort of like, I, I'd had it as enough of the situations to be like, oh, actually, this is damaging. When, when I don't say something, when I don't ask a question, it's ask, actually damaging. So I flipped it, went and asked the question, and it was great. And then from that moment onwards, again, one of those kind of like, you know, sort of like kinks in the road where you just take yeah. a, a different, yeah, you do something a little differently and you learn that lesson that stuck with you for life. That was definitely one for me. So oh. after that moment, it's always just ask the question. Yes. Because they, yeah. they know that you're messing up. Right. They hear it every They're time. They're just not saying it. Yeah. When, you're, when you think that they don't know or you're hoping that they, know, they don't know, look, they know. They, they know. know. Yeah. Exactly. Man. So, yeah. So just be curious and ask as many questions as possible. Yeah. And this is about accountability. This is, and, and it's about self worth, um, you know, uh, self esteem, awareness. And it's hard. It is hard to be the person. You want to be the guy that knows all the cool jazz endings. But if you're not, ask that where this really lands for me is references in the studio someone saying oh I'll do that tame impala thing if you don't know what that is you got to find out what it is and the easiest way to do that is to admit that you don't know and say can you just play that for me i mean i lost my exactly. first studio gig you right you just exactly and nobody is going to be like oh i can't believe that you know i mean obviously you want to know some of the big big references i mean i lost my first studio gig i mean i've told that story about you know the yeah. paul mccartney thing and i was like oh and I, I didn't really know the reference i knew the name didn't know the reference tried it didn't admit it was like oh yeah i got it i got it tried it failed fired <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. so if you can just admit, say, you know what? Ah, oh, I haven't dive, dove into that catalog. Can you just play me a reference? T typically people are totally happy to do that. A re another really good one. Um, 
with uh, Hutchinson, when I joined that band, I found out that he was a huge Elvis Costello fan. And I knew some of the big hits, but I didn't know a catalog. And I, we'd been around each other a lot. And he, he would bring it up. He would say, oh, you know, Bruce Thomas um, from that first Costello band. And I, would, and I was just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I kind of and I kind of thought I knew because I've listened to watching the detectives. And, you know, I, I, I get it. But I didn't really know. So there was a moment he really loves, Eric loves making playlists. And I was like, hey, would you ever consider making me... Um, a Costello playlist. And he was like, oh, I would love to. And he made me this like 60 song through the ages, complete with notes of like, okay, here's the early stuff. This is post marriage to Diana Krall. Listen to what happened to his sound and what it was. Then I listened to it. And what it was, was a bonding experience. (laughs) Then we became homies as a result of me, not just sort of like pretending puffy chested that I knew all of his references. I was like, man, I, I would actually like to know more. Would you be willing to do this? And he was thrilled to do it. So yeah, ask the questions. Just be brave enough to say that you don't know something, you know? Yeah, like I think there's so much damage people like put them put themselves through unnecessarily in yeah. terms of sort of like their trajectory of their career by just not being honest. Yeah. And, and like, it's, 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 by just I, like, I don't know why we... I d- yeah, I don't know why we do this. It's fucked up, isn't it? I mean, like, why do we do- humans? We're strange beasts, aren't we? We're it's, really strange. Uh, we, like, well, for you, yeah. That you, on that that first opportunity, you know, the the Paul McCartney one, where you said, and if anybody hasn't listened, like Ian basically said, the guy was like, hey, like a like a Paul McCartney kind of baseline, and Ian was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah don't worry about it. I'm going to nail this. Yeah, whatever, and had n- no clue what a Paul McCartney baseline sounded like, and obviously yes. lost the gig. And yes. just on the flip, can imagine if it, it would have gone like this, if it, you know, like a Paul McCartney kind of ba- bass line. And you could have said, uh, you know what, I've not actually listened to many Beatles tunes. Which, like, what two or three Beatles tunes do you think, like, really would give me a taste of that specific, like, that kind of bass line you're looking yes. for? Yes. And the guy would have probably been like, oh, kind of like a, you want to check out this, that, and the other. And you'd be like, oh, wicked. Okay, I'm just going to take a quick listen. Like the engineer is not going to, or the MD, they're not going to freak out. They're just going to, it's going to be great. (laughs) And and in fact, in fact, it's the opposite. It gives them an opportunity for leadership. It gives them an opportunity to show how much they know and to talk about the things that they like. You know, typically when someone throws out a reference, it's something that they're really familiar with and that they really like. So, you know, if someone says a name of a band and you don't know what that is, to pretend to know. I mean, I just, I just think it comes from ego and from fear. Like you don't, Mm. the fear of not being one of the cool musicians that knows all the references is too great. That's usurping your vulnerability to say, you know what? I actually don't know that because then you might be outed as the not cool musician, you know, but really it's the opposite. If you own that stuff, if you go, Oh, that's something that I know that I need to get into. Can you provide me a way in to that catalog of music? Then typically MDs, producers, engineers, whatever, like, yeah, man. Oh, check this out. Have you heard, you know, and they're pulling it up and everybody's having a Spotify party at that point. And so give people the opportunity to do that. Let people show you music. Don't pretend like you know it all, you know? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I need to call myself out on so. I bet I do this already. I, I'm like in in that. I bet it, I, I bet I still do it now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a real effort to just keep an I eye still, on that one dude, because I, I still think do it now too. Do you? And yeah, I feel yeah. myself if it's a thing where someone just, especially if it's followed up by like, oh well, you know, like I'm talking to a, a bass player that I admire or something, and they're like, oh yeah, well that thing, like you know that thing. It's so much easier to say, yeah. And let the conversation keep rolling as opposed yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Yeah. I don't know that. And like, oh, well. Yeah. And, <laughs> and also right. like scenarios that aren't within music as well. Like there was a few that I was thinking of when we were just having this conversation, just thinking, shit, am I doing that now in different yeah. conversations outside of music? I bet I am. Anyway, I'm going to, yep. I'm going to keep an eye on that for myself. Yeah, I need to. Okay. Well. Number 10. This yeah. is it. Number 10. Number 10 is, and this is, Similar to the bonus tip, the bonus tip for the Ten Commandments to getting the gig, the bonus tip was practice your ass off whenever you can. Ultimately, your your bass playing is where the book stops. Number ten for the commandments to keep in the gig is be continually trying to to try to improve yourself and your playing. Yeah. Just continually trying to do a better job of what you're doing, and that could be like broad strokes. It could be your playing. 
it could be your social vibe, what you like to hang out with, like the energy you're turning up with, the focus on the gig when we talked about being, you know, consistent. And I think what it, what it really is is many different things, but just be, I guess, aware of aware of all of these elements and continually trying to push them forward and improve. Yeah. And knowing that, knowing that we can all improve in many different areas. Oh, it's so, it's so true. I mean, and the ones that to me that stick out that I need to work on the most, the communication aspect about getting back to people in a timely manner, that's something that I can yeah. need to and will be better, be better at, I must, I must do that. And I also too get kind of complacent on gigs where, you know, I've played the same thing for a long time and maybe I'm not listening. I, I can always do a better job of like listening and responding instead of thinking all like bass first. Something that I really try to do and need to continually get better at is listen to the vocal listen to the drummer like like really just listen to everything except for me especially on things where i feel like i'm good i'm i'm i've played this a lot i'm not going yeah. to now reinvent this wheel what i need to do now is be more dynamic i need when the singer starts to sing i need to bring my level my dynamic down from an eight to a six and then in a pre-chorus, I need to bring it up to a seven. And then in the chorus, I need to be at a nine. You know, some small details like that where I'm not thinking so much about what's the cool fill I'm going to play or what's like, but being really a part of this band and how best to like make everyone else sound good. I think that's like the continual thing for me of like, I always need to be working at that. Yeah, yeah. Me too, man. Me too. I'm going to work on all this stuff. I'm looking at the list now. There's a lot. <laughs> I need to put a lot of work in. <laughs> yeah. But that's the best bit, right? That's the best bit. Yeah. It's, it's cool. Of course. It's yes. Cool. Yeah. And don't hear Scott and I saying, like, we know because we do all this stuff perfectly. These are all things that everybody struggles with and we struggle with, of course, just as much as anybody else. Yeah, absolutely. So let's run over them one more time and then we'll yeah. call it. So number one, prepare your ass off when possible. Number two, be early or don't be late. Yeah, don't anything. be late. Num number three, don't be too loud. Number four, don't practice on the gig. Number five, be consistent. Six, be a great communicator via text and email, fast and prompt replies. And number seven, be a great hang, be cool, be enthusiastic and don't be overbearing. Number eight, go the extra mile, carry gear, pick somebody up, write out some charts, whatever you can do, look for opportunities where you can go the extra mile. Number nine, be curious and ask questions, do not be the silent kid at the back of the class. And number 10, be continually trying to improve yourself in all of these areas and obviously you're playing as well. I want to ask you this. Is there a bonus tip? Is there an 11? There's no bonus tip, man. Have you got a bonus tip? <laughs> oh, I wish I asked you and now I'm not prepared to, I'm not prepared to give you a bonus tip. Um, here's, okay, sure. I'll give you one. Uh, and this, this one is, this one is maybe kind of a no brainer, but it's something that I just heard JMJ say, Justin Meldel Johnson, the great JMJ talks about one of the best things that you can possibly do for your trajectory in music is just really have a broad palette of music listening. So instead of mm -hmm. thinking always about gear, I mean, you know, like always about gear or licks or grooves or, <laughs> right, to really, <laughs> really, really spend some of that time. If that's you, if that's you or where you're not listening to a lot of music, I talk to people who say like, oh man, you know, I don't really listen to a lot of new music. I listen to podcasts, I listen to comedy shows, I watch Netflix. Wow. Well, I feel that way too. Um, and I'm trying uh, to increase my listening because if you listen to more music, you just have, you're more steeped in the language. You understand more references. Immediately when someone plays something, it calls to mind something else. It helps you write bass lines. People that ask me, you know, in student focus or around uh, SBL, like, how do you write bass lines? It's like, well, yes, you have to have vocabulary. You have to be able to, you know, know what the chord tones are, but also you have to have yeah. listened to a lot of music. Listening to music is such a great way to improve all of this stuff. It'll give you things to talk about with your bandmates. It will uh, experience you in learning new lines or picking up new sounds, uh, learning new tones. Like, wow, that's kind of a cool sound. Like all these things that we're talking about today may actually be helped by just simply endeavoring to listen to more music in general.
I don't know. What do you think of that? I actually, no, yeah, no, absolutely. I think that it's what I fall down a little bit in that area. To Me too. I think that I used to be, I, I used to be great, but for whatever reason, as I've got older, I think that like, oh, I don't know what it's, um, I'm going to say I listen to less music. Sure. <gasps> yes. But yeah, but of course, right? Because you have so many other responsibilities and you're, you know, <laughs> you're, you're flying this ship. Right? I mean, and you know, you're like, I can't be bothered with yeah. listening to music. I'm flying the ship. <laughs> right? Do you know what? I, do you know what? I wonder what it is as well. And we should definitely do like a, a, a like a, an episode on this in the future. I wonder if it's because it's so readily available nowadays. I feel like, you know, I feel like when I was younger, I used to have to sort of like fight to get yeah, the, get the good mean. stuff, you yes. know, like, oh man, it was like, I used to go down the record store and I'd sort of like try and find the record that, oh, and they haven't got it in, maybe they'll get it in next week. And it was sort of like, there was this consistent battle and then you'd finally get it and then you'd like listen to it yeah. because there was this, this because you'd freaking, you'd battled to get the damn thing special. in the first place, special. right? special, yes. special and then you'd listen to yeah. it for weeks and weeks and weeks, all of the songs and there was this, because of the pain that you'd put into getting it and because it just wasn't sort of like instantly just all on tap all of the time whenever you wanted it, it you just had a different relationship with it once you got it. That's and so now true. it's just like, we, it spews it. It's I mean, a like fire hose Spotify. of music. <laughs> it's a fire hose. Yes. There's no pain. There's no... There's no kind of like barrier to entry. You don't have to put any work into getting the thing. And because it's all instantly available, I think that that, I think it just, yeah, it, it alters our relationship with music somewhat. And I think that- For sure. Yeah. For and, sure. It, and that's what it's been like for me, for sure. And I think that it's like this in many different ways, isn't it? I think that you you want what you need to work for. You know, you really want it because it's you're so working true. for it. You know, yep. you, you know, whether it be sort of like actually working or just, you know, just- you know, you're like excited about it, but you can't get it. And you know, you're oh, I like, know, oh, I know. I mean, you know, and yeah. but but it will never return to just vinyl or you know, or compact discs. And you know, right, streaming is here forever, presumably. Let me say this yeah. two things that have helped my music intake. Um, there's a radio station in Minneapolis called The Current. It's connected to NPR, which is National Public Radio. And it's yeah. wonderful. It's uh, like an alternative music station and they're playing a ton of different stuff. So it's a bunch of different genres and it's curated and it's cool. And they, to me, have some of the hippest stuff. It's 89.3, there's an app, it's called The Current. There's an app for it too, you can stream it anywhere. It's unbelievable. Um, so I that is essentially just going in our house 24 seven, even at night, I just kind of turn it down, but it's still kind of on in the kitchen. It's on all the time. And I am frequently hearing things there that maybe then I'll grab my bass. I'll go like, ooh, what's that? I mean, that's how I first heard about Lizzo. It's how I first heard about, oh, I don't know. I think I think Tame Impala. Like all these bands that have blown up, I heard about first on The Current. So if you have a radio station that you can just have on, kind of in the background, chances are something will kind of ping you and pull you in. The second thing, and this yeah. is harder, the second thing is when someone that you love, respect, admire, whatever, someone in your orbit says, hey man, you gotta check out this record, do it. Instead of going, yeah, so here's it, right? Here's it. I do, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, totally. I need to check that out. Here's what you do instead. This is, and, and I'm talking to myself, you take your phone, you go, say it again, I'm gonna, you know, and you open your note that says, you know, recommended music and you put it in there. And then you really try to work on, you, you try to listen to that stuff when you're thinking, ah, I need to listen to something. You open that thing and go, oh man, Scott told me to check this thing out. I'm gonna do that yeah. right now on yeah. my drive to the, you know. And it's that's hard work, but it is so worth it. It's so worth it. Dude. Dude, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Man, <laughs> we are going to have to call it because yeah. um, <laughs> I'm getting uh, I'm getting texts from Lisa saying, dude, where are you? <laughs> Dinner's on the table. <laughs> hey, dinner dinner is on the freshly sanded table that Lisa painstakingly. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the Instagram post Man. killed With me, dude. I loved we've, it. We've been we've been eating on the carpet like on trays for the last two days because she won't let us go on the table. Seriously. Anyway, dudes, thanks so much for listening. Yes. We will see you next week. Take it easy. See you in a bit. Bye. Cheers, everybody.